I can't take it anymore. Today, I'm going to be staring at walls and harassing the residents of City 17. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. When is it all going to end? Don't worry. It doesn't take much to make me want to replay Half-Life 2. And for the first time ever, I played through it with ray tracing, which uses screen space global illumination to light the environment as best as possible. Cut it out! You know what I like about Half-Life 2? Everything. But one thing that often goes unsung about its many achievements is its portrayal of Alex, a friendly NPC who assists you throughout the game. Oh, and did I mention? She's female. It would have been easy for Half-Life 2 to have sexualised her, to give her exposed skin, bouncy breasts and a slightly tired looking expression. But they didn't. They respected her and treated her as a character, just like they did with Barney and Dr. Kleiner. I still remember that moment early on when she rescues me from the Combine, and as I come to, I'm greeted by her very normal and very lifelike a- JESUS! Welcome to the dark side of graphics mods. It's all fun and games until somebody blows their polygon budget on a virtual nipple. This is not using ray tracing, this is just the fake factory cinematic mod for Half-Life 2. If you're looking to enhance the graphics of a game, then you can go about it either by using clever tricks like ray tracing, or you can use a more traditional graphics overhaul mod such as this one. Looking past the questionable character models, it's actually really impressive, and I'm inclined to give this a full playthrough at some point as well. But it's just, why these character models? They claim to be high definition, and sure, they up the texture detail, but at what cost? For they also strip the personality from every character in the game, swapping them out for shallow, generic husks of their former selves. Come on, Gordon. Let's go. That's my girl. They become the sort of characters you'd imagine a horny teenage boy would come up with, if told to make Half-Life 2. They're technically superior to the originals, yet also so lacklustre. Luckily, they're entirely optional. You now have to go out of your way to activate them in this mod, which I did. Why did I do that? What the hell is wrong with me? Well, I did it because I feel like if I'm going to experience a mod, then I want to experience the whole thing. But the whole point is, Fake Factory's graphics mod changes the game. Some people will be delighted with every aspect of it. Other people, not so much. That's the beauty of mods. There's one for everyone. Who am I to criticise them? For surely my tastes are equally perverted. It's just not for thick-lipped Alex's, nor for waifus. For me, my love is ray tracing. Even one as limited and as flawed, and as over the top as the one that I'm using here. I love it, flaws and all. And I'm not ashamed to admit it. Again, it's completely optional. It comes with many sliders, so its implementation can be as subtle as you please. And yet, I want it all. If I'm going to experience this and to suffer the slowdown accompanied with it, then I'm going to ramp that stuff to 11. I do this partly because I'm fascinated by the technology, and having it be there so visually obvious on the screen, it helps me to learn about it, and to be able to spot more subtle examples in other games and in real life. Another reason I have it like this, I'll be honest, is because I kind of like it. But don't let this video put you off ray traced global illumination, nor the Fake Factory graphics mod. There's something here for everyone. This reshade plugin, this screen space implementation of global illumination, is arguably inferior to Half-Life 2's default lighting. Sure, the base game doesn't look great these days, but at least it's stable. It won't glare in places where it isn't wanted, or to rudely flash in your face. And surely, the whole point of taking the heavy performance hit of ray tracing is to use its brute force approach to get the lighting right. Looking at it like that, this ray trace solution might manage to be both technically and artistically lacklustre. It is limited to just screen space information, so instead of a 3D area, it creates the technology using just this view and this one to mimic the lighting, based on distances and directions. Given this immense handicap, it looks amazing in my opinion, but it does mean that as you move about, lighting effects will appear and disappear, or shimmer distractingly. For some people, that will be reason enough not to try it out, and I can't argue with that. But don't get me wrong. I get the impression people think I can't see the limitations here, that I'm so blinded by my love of technology that I fail to see its flaws. But I see them clearly enough. Their flaws are part of the novelty for me, and I love messing with graphics options. So until there's a better version, I'll gladly make do with this. Much like some people with their fake factory females. So please, throw your judgments about the ray tracing to one side and come on a magical ray trace journey through the game with me to understand it from my perspective. You might even gain an appreciation for it. I played through the whole game with ray tracing enabled, and here are my thoughts on which bits looked the best, and which bits looked the worst. The good. 
shine a light on this red tube full of something here and the room glows red. This is a very convincing effect and it's what would happen in this particular instance. So I like it. When you think about it, proper global illumination is actually just real time lighting. And the impact it has on this cactus teleporter is stunning, casting moving light beams across the wall and generally making this whole experiment feel more alive. Oh, fine. It'll be another week. And the same with this fire here. It's easy to forget that without this effect, the lighting in this scene is fixed. But turn it on and the leaping flames cast changing lighting onto the surrounding environment. Nice. It doesn't have to be all dramatic landscapes and vivid vistas. I also liked this humble crate in a vent. The ray tracing convincingly shades the walls next to the crate and casts extra coloured lighting onto the floor in front of it which blends everything in this scene together nicely. Remember this isn't a reflection. I have to tell you that because at points I think I forget that myself. If the vents were reflective then you get another yellowy box effect from the surrounding vents as well, on top of the lighting bleed scene here. The limitations caused by screen space result in something more like a reflection here as well, transforming this otherwise blue crate into an almost creamy white colour from the light bouncing off the wall. This sort of thing is easily missed but I found the effect to be extremely visually pleasing on both sides of this object, and something that's completely overlooked in the base game. And the way the lighting from that lit up screen is subtly cast onto the wall behind it really pleases me as well, as do the now properly darkened corners. If I had to show you just one level to win you over to the benefits of ray tracing, it would have to be that bit just after Alex is captured. It's a sewer, but with lighter coloured walls than normal, and the ray tracing makes them look so right, really dreamy, but whilst retaining the dark corners. And I knew already that that huge warehouse near the end would also look great, and it didn't disappoint. Ray tracing revealed to me just how flat it looked previously. The general rule of where ray tracing looks good in Half-Life 2 is where there are lightly coloured or sunlit surfaces in otherwise dark looking environments. The ray tracing nicely darkens the dark bits and lights up the bits which should be lit up by bounce lighting. It simply makes places like the sewers feel less flat and in some places actually quite beautiful, despite the blocky brush based decor. The bad. I'll be honest, it was hard to find the bad since most of the time troublesome results could be mitigated by fiddling with the settings. I personally love interiors to be flooded with light, or for the evening sunlight to brighten up the surrounding surfaces in a warm glow, but I know that reality isn't always going to be that extreme or pronounced. The coast section of the game was challenging for me because I had to keep turning the effect down when I was outside, otherwise I'd risk everything being too brightly lit, but then the moment I went inside I had to ramp it up again because otherwise I couldn't see. It behaved almost like HDR does, but in reverse. I reckon with proper support by the game's levels, like where it automatically adjusts the settings as you go indoors or outdoors, I think even screen space ray tracing could look quite appealing. I wasn't impressed with Ravenhome either. I think that bit of the game was already well lit, and ray tracing just amplified it too much by making the dark bits too dark and the lit up bits way too bright, unless I turn the effect down so low that it might as well have been off. And it does sometimes mistake things like your gun model for being a huge distant object instead. And if it does that then it casts giant shadows in places just because they happen to be behind your weapon. I'll admit, I didn't see this happen too much with the settings I used. I was expecting it to be hugely distracting throughout, but it wasn't. Rooms with fences would plunge the far side into darkness. It seems that the rays aren't capable of fitting through such small holes. So that's another no-no for the glow glow. And while shadows where they shouldn't be can be distracting, lighting where it shouldn't be can be even more annoying. Look at how this crate in the distance is being lit up like it's right next to the fire in the foreground. Disgusting. But also interesting. And last, the volumetric lighting effects didn't work too nicely with ray tracing either, like this hazy area below a lit lamp in Kleiner's lab. This sort of thing revealed the inner workings of the ray tracing, providing an almost naked view into the ambient occlusion model. So there's the good, the bad, and this is the ugly. As a fan of the effect, who likes to ramp it up to unnatural levels, it takes a lot to disgust me but some parts of the game managed it. Nova Prospect, you know, the bit with the antlines that you control, is a phenomenal chapter of the game, and in my opinion, it's already beautifully lit, thanks to its strong blue and orange colour scheme. Well, ray tracing gets those colours and amplifies them. Rooms with a previously tasteful blue hue would transform into bright green. It took me a while to realise how ugly this was. I was just there thinking, wow, this is a great result from the ray tracing, before it dawned on me that this just doesn't look right. It can be visually stunning, yes, but also but ugly, especially the blues. 
but an honourable mention to the antlions. It's not their fault that the environments are so stupidly lit up in garish colours. And yet, I thought the lighting it applied to them looked amazing. Seeing the bugs have their undersides lit up like this looked stunning. It really made them look like waxy, bulky beings. I might have to start upscaling antlions next. In conclusion, I found ray tracing to have mixed results in Half-Life 2. I will admit, most of the time I preferred the effect being on, even when it was deeply flawed. But I do acknowledge that this isn't for everybody. Especially those who just want to play the game without being distracted by when it gets the effect wrong. It is, after all, lighting being added to existing lighting. Because the source engine behind Half-Life 2 already uses ray tracing to calculate its lighting. It's just too reserved on the bounce lighting for my liking. I think Half-Life 2's default lighting works best outside, where there's perhaps the scale required to get the effect right. Because in comparison to the exteriors, the interiors of Half-Life 2 look but ugly. And even with its flawed implementation, ray tracing greatly improved the look of the interiors and the apartments, and especially the sparse, blocky looking sewer sections of the game. I also found it helped to shade small objects outside, which are perhaps too small or dynamic to get Source's default baked in lighting applied to them. I have worked with the Source engine extensively since it came out, and I think its lighting has got better in newer titles such as CSGO. Half-Life 2, in comparison, doesn't seem to shade props very well at all, and this was particularly evident on levels with lightly coloured floors. The ray tracing helped stuff to blend in better with the scenery, especially in the coastal segments. I always thought something looked wrong about this crane, and now I know what it was. All it needed was a bit of ray tracing. I think the major problem with global illumination is that it's hard to know when it gets it right. It's only when you compare it with when it's off that you see how wrong video games tend to get this sort of lighting. Up till now I've shown you the before and after, but honestly it's the after than before, which is a lot more impactful. Because I find showing the ray traced one first really hammers home how flat and lifeless the environments look once it's turned off again. What's the saying? If you can't handle it at its worst, you don't deserve it at its best. Very few things in life are black and white. I admit this ray tracing is greyer than most, and also more colourful. But even if you don't like the result, I hope you can appreciate why I find this technology interesting, and why it's so exciting even with such a limited implementation. Because already in some places in this game, its benefits are undeniable. Especially when indoors, it greatly improves how a scene such as this one is lit. 3 Clicks Philip recently did a video showcasing this sort of ray tracing on Inferno, and from the comment section it's clear that most people dislike the result. And I expect something similar to happen with this video, but I think that's missing the point of it. Now I know 3 Clicks Philip, I can say for a fact that he's also aware of its limitations. He's listed them in the description for crying out loud, but please see that as a challenge to spot its strengths. Don't view this as black and white, and understand from my perspective why I'm excited about the changes this brings to the table. So going back to what I was saying at the beginning, if you want to improve an existing game, sure, one way of going about that is to download a mod for it. You might find one that's perfect for you. You might think that it's an all-round improvement. Great. Or you might feel it's changed the game a little too much from how you remembered it. Or perhaps it makes changes that you find questionable or tasteless. If you don't share the modder's vision for their makeover, there's no need to get upset about it. No need to get angry. Besides, you're the one who decided to download the mod, not to click on his video. So if you don't like it, then you can do what it says on the wall just here. Not what it says here. Oh no. But I hope this video has helped you to understand my obsession with the Reshade RTGI plugin. You might not agree with me about it, but I hope you can now see my point of view and why I don't care about its flaws. Now, if the maker of this mod could please come forward and explain to me what they were thinking when they made it, I'd appreciate that too. And while we're on the topic, what's the deal with waifus? Let's see what I can do to clear the way for you. 